Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I pray that every mom in here today feels blessed and loved and appreciated. And if you have not wished mom a happy Mother's Day, uh, now's a good time. Don't get up and move around. If she's somewhere else uh, in, the, in the worship center or someplace else entirely, just text her, okay? And she'll text you back. And it's not too late. And uh, hey, happy Mother's Day. Now, Moms, let me, let me just say, so much of what I say today, I'm gonna try to direct uh, just really just right at you. Uh, but, but everything I say today is gonna be from God's word and it, it applies to all of us equally. And, and as I think about Mother's Day as a, as a pastor, it's, it's always kind of a challenge, you know, do, do you really kind of hone in on, on trying to comfort moms, right? or challenge moms. I mean, right now, and, and I'm, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get y'all to just vote on which sermon you want this morning, moms. <laughs> yeah, do we go with comfort, five things we love about mom, right? Or do we go with challenge, five keys to being a better mom? So which are we gonna do? No, 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 don't, don't, don't vote. But, but both are needed, right? I mean, comfort, uh, mom guilt is a real thing. Help me out, moms, is that true or not? coulda, woulda, shoulda kind of impacts all of us. And, and so it's appropriate, I mean, to, to come in with comfort, right? And mom, I really do pray that God will comfort you this morning. And especially if you just kind of let these words just kind of uh, just marinate in your heart and soul this morning, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Mom, aren't you grateful this morning? It says, look into Jesus, and he's the one that initiates the faith in our heart and in our children's hearts, and he's the one that completes the faith in our heart and our children's hearts. He is the one who does it. It doesn't say looking to mom or dad or parents. It doesn't say uh, looking to a mom who does everything right as a mom and then you can found faith in your child and you can perfect faith. In, no, 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 it just says looking to Jesus. And mom, if you really just kind of grab a hold of that right now, it can comfort so much in your soul. As a matter of fact, mom, I'm gonna make kind of a crazy statement that um, I just want you to think about. I didn't read it in a book somewhere, so you better make sure that you agree or disagree with it. I mean, you're free to do either, but here's the statement. Moms, your child's faith depends on who your child fixes their eyes on more than it does on anything you do or don't do. Now, does a mom have a responsibility? Of course, and we're gonna talk about that this morning. But mom, here's the reality. Jesus is the one who is leading the change and Jesus is the one who is bringing about the change. And moms, I want you to be comforted this morning, but it's also appropriate to challenge, right? I mean, in seminary, they taught us a preacher's job is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. So it's appropriate to challenge moms on Mother's Day, right? I mean, come on. Uh, the fact is we could all do better. Kim and I were very intentional in raising our children. We communicated to them over and over. What we want for your life is for you to love Jesus and follow Jesus and obey Jesus no matter what it is that you do in life. And so we were intentional and certainly we raised them in church, uh, pretty well, quite literally raised them in church. And, and we prayed over them. We read the Bible to them. Man, I I would sing over them at night, and it's Mother's Day, so I'm gonna spare all of you moms the indignity of having to listen to me sing. But I would just sing over them, oh, how he loves you and me, oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life, what more could he give? Oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me. And I would sing over them every time I put them to bed at night until they got old enough that they started saying, stop, <laughs> don't sing, Dad. And then I would just sing, oh, how he loves me, but not you. <laughs> but the reality is, 
my daughter, my oldest came along, got married, and they have a couple of kids, and they're raising our grandkids, and I look at how they're raising our grandkids, and I got to tell you, I'm just thinking, coulda, woulda, shoulda. I like the way they're parenting better than the way I parented. So it's appropriate to challenge moms on Mother's Day, but mom, listen to me. Not so much from the vantage point of, here's five keys to being a better mom, not looking at what you're doing or not doing. I want to challenge you and I want to comfort you by inviting us all to look at what Jesus is doing in your life and through your life with your kids. We're continuing in the sermon series that we started a couple of weeks ago, and it's our text in Galatians chapter 5, verses 20, verse 22, and it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. This morning, we're going to look at peace and patience. And, and here's one thing that I pray that you walk away with truly believing this morning, mom. And here it is. God is already at work in your life and in your child's life. And he just invites you to follow his lead. Mom, I want you to be comforted by this idea. God is already working. Don't you love how it says the fruit of the Spirit? Fruit of the Spirit. Not the fruit of moms. The fruit of moms who do parenting perfectly. The fruit of moms who are really, really obedient to Jesus and really wise and really have it all together. No, no, no. It says the fruit of the Spirit. Here's the thing I want you to get, Mom. Jesus is in charge of the fruit production in your life and in your child's life. He is large and in charge. Jesus said on another occasion, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. See, here's the thing. Jesus is the one who is in charge of the transformation of your child's heart and life. When I think of the fruit of the Spirit, I think of the time that I spent in the Rio Grande Valley. Kim and I moved there in 1991 with our three kids. And when we got there, there was just miles and miles of orchards after orchards, each just filled with this orange goodness. You zero in on one of those trees and, and they had these big, beautiful, juicy oranges, not these little stinking whatever these things are that we handed out. It's like, oh, we're gonna be on a budget cut here or something. <laughs> I think we found these. They're called cuties. I call them dinkies. I don't know what this is. But let me tell you, this is not a Rio Grande Valley orange. No, those things are big, oh, monster things. And they are, we had one in our yard and out there playing with the kids. You peel one, and man, it's enough to feed the whole family. I mean, it was, they're awesome. But here's the thing I learned about orange trees in my time in the Rio Grande Valley. Listen, uh, the orange tree had these branches. The branches would bear the fruit, but the branches weren't producing the fruit. No, the fruit is produced by the trunk and it's connected to the roots and, and the nutrients and the, and the moisture, the water flows up through the roots and the trunk and, and then there's leaves on the photosynthesis and, and I'm an ag ed major, but I just got above my pay grade right there. Just God produced the fruit, the branches just bear the fruit. How do I know the branches weren't producing the fruit? Because you cut one of those babies off and even if that branch already had fruit on it, I'm telling you, you cut the branch off from the trunk and it's no time before that orange starts looking like this little dinky thing. Inedible. But listen, when it is abiding in the trunk, oh, those oranges grow big and juicy and they are just the best thing you will ever eat. Mom, listen to me this morning. Please hear this. You're the branch. And yes, God calls you to abide in Jesus and stay connected to Jesus. And in staying connected to Jesus, Jesus does a work in your life. And I pray to God, he'll do a work through your life and he'll do a work in your child's life. But Jesus is the one who is in charge of fruit production, not you, mom. So be comforted by that. But doesn't it make sense? 
If Jesus is the one who's in charge of producing the fruit, that you and I would follow his lead. And I'm not just talking to moms here because the truth is, and this is not a text, Galatians 5.22, that's addressed specifically to moms. It's addressed to all Christ followers. And doesn't it make sense that we would just follow his lead? So what is it that Jesus is doing in the lives of our children? Number one, he is producing the fruit of peace. Now, peace is just this tranquility of mind. It is the calm in the midst of the storm and not so much deliverance from the storm itself. And as a mom, as a dad, as a parent, we want to deliver our child, our children from the storms. We want to protect them from the storms. But that's not really God's intention. God's intention is to produce this fruit called peace so that in the midst of the storm, your child has this, this calmness, this confidence, uh, th th there's something in their spirit that is singing even on the darkest day, it is well with my soul. And I believe that God is gonna cause all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Listen to me, that's called a God goal. And sometimes that's different than a mom goal or a dad goal or a parent goal or a child goal. As a parent, we have goals and mom goals are great. Can we all agree on that before I start distinguishing between God goals and mom goals? Mom goals are good. Say it man with me or I'm gonna have to, yeah, okay. Are we good? All right, yeah. Oh, wow, you're gonna repeat it. That's, I love that. Now listen to me. So often, mom goals and dad goals and Gary goals with kids are, hey, I want you to get up out of bed on time. I want you to pick up your room, do your chores. I want you to do your homework. I want you to study. I want you to excel in school, make first chair in band. I want you to have a happy life. And listen, there's nothing wrong with mom goals, but listen, God's goal. You wanna know what God is really focused on in the soul of your child? Number one, it is to produce love, this love for God and others. Number two, it is to produce joy, this joy that is not shaped by the circumstances of life. And then number three, number three on the list of God goals is to produce in your child peace, but it's also to produce in your child the fruit of patience. Did you see that in the text? Patience. Patience means long suffering. What does it mean? as a mom, to have the fruit of patience just growing in your soul. It means that you begin to understand as a mom that your child's spiritual development is a marathon, not a sprint. I mean, think about it, it just makes sense, right? Uh, your child's physical de development, their mental development is a marathon, not a sprint. So is their spiritual development. Here's the reality. Your child is not going to go from taking their first step to the next day running the Boston Marathon, right? Oh, look, honey, little Susie just took her first step. Hey, we better get up to Boston. The race is tomorrow and I know she's gonna win it. You know, no, 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 no. Uh, from the first step to running the Boston Marathon, that's a marathon, that's not a sprint. It's gonna take a while to get there. Same thing with mental development. Your child is not gonna go from speaking his or her first we words, uh, weeds, where did that come from? So anyway, not go from speaking their first words, right, to, to writing a doctoral dissertation. No, that's a marathon, not a sprint. And in the very same way, your child is not gonna go from being a newborn in Christ to being the second coming of the Apostle Paul in a month. See, you're gonna have to recognize that, hey, this whole thing is, is a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint. That's why it says in the book of Philippians, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion did you see the last of the verse at the day of Jesus? When is the day of Jesus? 
The day of Jesus is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is, yeah, your child came to faith and they, they were justified. They were delivered from the penalty of sin. But right now, mom, there's this process of sanctification that is going on where God is progressively delivering them from the power of sin as they abide in Jesus and dwell in Jesus. And then one day, oh, it's gonna be completed. He's gonna complete the work when they are glorified and God delivers them from the presence of sin. But until then, mom, listen to me. It's a marathon, not a sprint. That's what it means to have the fruit of patience as a mom. Man, I didn't have that as a dad. I, I really wanted to microwave my kids' mental development, physical development, and spiritual development. So I was really intense. And I was a, a disciplinarian. Kim exhibited much more the fruit of patience when we were raising our kids. But you know what? I don't really care now because I'm making up for lost time with my two granddaughters. They've never done anything wrong. But should they ever do anything wrong? My kids are not even gonna recognize me. They're gonna go, who is this man inhabiting my dad's body? Because I'm just gonna be like, it's okay. God's not finished with them yet. Let's just pray and trust God to produce fruit in them before they kill themselves, you know? Mom, listen to me. What I want you to hear this morning is this. God's at work. And what he's inviting you to do is to follow his lead. And mom, I believe, listen to me, I, I believe you're in for such a blessing this morning because I've asked our children's pastor, Ivy Lassiter, to come up and just, just she, she has a unique perspective of seeing how God produced the fruit of peace and patience in the heart of a mom. And I've asked her to just come and share her insights so that we can leave here today both comforted and challenged. W would you help me to welcome Ivy up here this morning? Amen, thank you. Wow, y'all are like a little bit more welcoming than the 9.30 service, let's not tell them that, I appreciate it. Um, you're gonna see a picture up here of uh, my mom, and I know, and if it's not obvious, it is uh, taken in the 80s. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's on Mother's Day. My dad is taking the picture. That is me and my sister and my mom. And I wanna paint a picture for you guys of the mom that I remember from my preschool and elementary age years. Okay, so um, my mom was a task master very organized and productive and efficient. She woke up early and exercised to Paula Abdul's video, whatever situation. She stayed up late and made sure she had everything taken care of. She was fun, people liked her, she was a leader. She was very involved in my sister and my life. Like she substitute taught at our schools. Uh, she was the PTA president at Big Springs Elementary. Go Bobcats. Um, she was involved and wonderful. Our birthday parties were not lavish or expensive, but thoughtful and meaningful. Our vacations were well planned out. She was a wonderful mom, wonderful mom. Now, if you were paying attention, there are two words that I did not use when describing my mom. And those two words are peace or patient. <laughs> she was not, she was not. I called my sister a couple weeks ago, by the way, sorry, Kendall, throwing you under the bus up here. I called my sister a couple weeks ago and gave her no context. And I just said, hey, Kendall, think back to mom when we were in elementary school. Do you recall her being like a very patient or peaceful person? And she was like, let me think. No, I do not. And she goes, I mean, Ivy, remember the library books? And say no more. I remember the library books. You see, my mom would take us to the Richardson Public Library very consistently because she's a good mom. And when it was time to return all those books, one of us had misplaced one of the books 
And I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details up here on this stage, but I'm just going to tell you that my mom's response to us and our lost library book was not patient or peaceful whatsoever. All right. Um, But that changed. That when I think about my mom in my junior high years, my high school years or college years, I would actually say peace and patience were in the top 10 qualities that she exuded. I really would. You see, when I was in seventh grade, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And we've come such a long way in medical technology. But at the time, my mom's prognosis was not very good. Um, She began this journey of scans and surgeries, uh, stem cell transplant, chemotherapy, radiation, And it was challenging, it was hard. And I watched my mom do things like uh, have a scan on a Thursday and not talk to the doctor who had the results until Monday. And I don't know if any of y'all have waited for news over a weekend like that, it's hard. Your mind begins to go places and tell stories about what this is gonna be and how is this gonna work out. (laughs) It's hard. And I watched my mom wait over weekends for those results and exude a peace that passes all understanding and endure that wait with a patience that really makes no logical sense. I also had this front row seat to my mom um, enduring the side effects of chemotherapy. That's awful. That's awful. And I watched my mom walk through that, walk through that suffering and exude a peace and a patience that makes no logical sense. How did that happen? How did my mom go from being a person who flipped out over a lost library book to then becoming a person who was able to exude this peace and patience in the middle of the most challenging of circumstances? How did that happen? I'll tell you. I saw it with my own eyes. I have proof. It's exactly what Gary described just a few moments ago, that when we connect with our God, when we abide with Jesus, when we spend time with him and prioritize that, what happens is he produces in us something that was not there before. It's true. I watched my mom, here's what abiding looked like for her. I distinctly remember in the morning, I was like a ninth grader, turning the corner to my mom's bedroom and to borrow clothes or shoes or makeup or whatever. Remember, I'm a teenage girl. I'd turn the corner and she would be sitting on her bed with her Bible open and her prayer journal out. This is actually one of her prayer journals out, reading God's word and praying. She would often ask me, hey Ives, uh, what can I pray for you about today? (laughs) Feel happy through make a friend. That was what was written on this day. And I would ask, hey, could you pray for this? And she would. I'm telling you, if you want to have the gift of the spirit come out of your life, it's as easy as spending time with the God who gives it to us. Okay, now I'm gonna kind of show you my cards up here. I'm gonna be real vulnerable with you because I'm like, okay, I I know this, I've read these words, I saw my mom do it, but why is it that I forget? (laughs) Why do I know that like Tuesday will come and I'll wake up and be like, wow, I feel so crazy and overwhelmed. Like, what is my problem? Well, the reality is there is a real battle going on for us 
There is a real battle going on where the enemy is using cruel tactics to deceive us and distract us and make us busy and keep us, he's doing everything he possibly can to keep us from connecting to a God that so desires to give us what we want and need. It's real. There's a real battle going on, which is why I so easily get distracted. I get busy. So when you walked in, you may have noticed orange juice. You may have gotten an orange. For those of you that it's your first time to the Heights, welcome. We don't always give fruit out. I just wanted you to know this is a special occasion. Here's what I need. Here's what I need is I need reminders in my life that the way to live the life that I want to live, the way to be the mom that I so desperately want to be is to connect with my God. And so every time you see fruit, which should be every day, is this not, hey, this sounds silly, but it works. Every time you see fruit, what if it became a reminder to you and to me, hey, connect with God. We go through Starbucks see the lemon pound cake. Okay, God, we're doing this today. <laughs> Moms, we're putting fruit snacks. We're way past the actual fruit because it's May. We're way, but we're putting fruit snacks in our kids' lunches. All right, God, be with my kids today. We're at a work conference table with a bowl of fake apples. Okay, God, be my voice today. What if every single time you and I saw fruit, we were reminded, nope, Connect with God. He is the source for the life that we want to live. He is the source to be the person that we want to be. Now, I had a mom that abided with Christ and from that place exuded a peace and patience. From that place, she was able to face some of life's most challenging trials and have a peace that has us all understanding. And that was a gift. But I wanna tell you, as her daughter, what was the gift to me? That I watched my mom not be a perfect mom. She was not perfect. I watched her connect with a perfect savior. And the gift of that for me today is exponential. You see, moms, we do not have to be perfect moms. We do not have to be perfect. We need to be people who are prioritizing being with a perfect savior. We do. And that is what I saw in my mom. The second gift to me of having a mom that abided with Jesus is I had a mom that prayed for me. I had a mom that prayed for me. I had a mom that prayed more for me than she lectured me. I had a mom that prayed more for me than she manipulated me. I had a mom that prayed more for me than tried to control me. I had a mom that prayed for me and the gift of that continues today. Continues. A couple weeks ago, I my dad and I were sitting on the back patio of some of our friend's house, and I'm not even sure why he brought it up, but he said, you know, um, Sweet, my mom's name was Sweet. I don't think I mentioned that. Sweet prayed for her girls every day. She prayed for her girls every day. And he said, it's a really significant thing to me but I have looked through those prayer journals and I see how the things that she prayed for back then have come to fruition today. Every single person in this room has access to talk to a God who's on the throne. Every single one of us. And it matters. It's powerful and effective. Let's be people who pray more for our children. The last thing, this was about a month before my mom passed away and we knew her days were numbered. And, um, 
And I asked her, hey, how do you feel about this? And she said, you mean about dying? And I said, yeah, how do you feel about that? And she, she said this sentence that I'm not even sure she recognized like the gift of it. I don't think I did. But it has stuck with me and it might be the best thing she's ever said to me. She said, you know, I am not worried about you or Kendall or your dad because I know that God has you. Do you hear the gift of that? The gift of that. That what our children so desperately need to hear is that God has them. Our children need to hear that. That no matter where they go, what challenging circumstances they face, who, who is cruel to them, what unexpected thing happens that no matter where they go, what they do, God has them. That is what our children need to hear. And we as people need to recognize what we are communicating. What are we communicating to our kids? The government does not have them. Our financial status does not have us. Our career does not have us. Our accolades and accomplishments does not have us. God is on the throne. God has us. God has you. God has your children. God will take care of you. I think about you seniors. Things are wrapping up. Chapter is ending and a new chapter is beginning. No matter where you go, what you do, God has you. God has you. Our children need to hear that. We're gonna sing one more song. And really this is kind of selfish on my part because it's, so, it's what I so desperately want. I want us to have this space just like the duration of this song. The space to be with a God who is fighting on your behalf, a God who is fighting for your children, a God who is in control, a God who is taking care of all of the details, a God who desires to be with you. I don't know what, things are heavy on your heart, what things, to-do lists you've got going through your mind. But right now, I want you to have the space to rest in the truth that God's at work. God has this. God has your children that is working on their behalf. You don't have to strive. You don't have to be in control. You don't have to manipulate. There is a God that is on the throne and fighting for you.